The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, like, we're here, but don't forget about, you know, this. And so the quiz is next Thursday. Uh, I'm going I'm to send an email out with office hours uh, uh, for, for that, for, you know, extra time. But if anyone wants to meet anytime, just send me an email, please. Okay? This piece at 2, we decided it's going to be due uh, the day before, on May 9th. And that's when your piece at 3 will be posted as well. And PSET 3 will have to do with the things we're, we've been talking about uh, the last you know, two lectures and today, which is you know, what, what you can do with solids. OK? Um, any questions about the plan, the schedule? OK. Right. Now, um, now there are other practice problems. Um, I'll, do, I'll throw one out from last year's quiz. So that, that's a practice quiz from, uh, that I, I gave out you know, a couple, maybe a year ago or two. Um, and then there's last year's quiz. And I'll pull a problem or two out from that. And, and we'll do one today. And then maybe we'll look at another one on Tuesday. Um, uh, what I want to cover in terms of the lecture material today is I want to kind of briefly start with that band structure and case space, and make sure we're feeling good about it, OK? And then um, tell you sort of a few other things you can do, right? We've talked about the band structure. We've talked about how um, it, it has so much information. Well, what other kinds of information is there? What can you do with these sorts of properties um, of solids? Um, we're, we're not going to, you know, this is, I love this cartoon. At some point, his theory becomes so abstract, it can only be conveyed using interpretive dance. And mostly it's because of the visuals that I get on, on my colleagues here at MIT kind of just dancing. But, um, but I, you know, we're not going to get this complicated, right? So the point isn't for me to do a lecture on transport theory and, and tell you, you know, uh, all about phonons and go into great detail about these different things. That is, again, not been our point here. The point is uh, to keep relevant and keep pretty applied. In, in this in this class, so so I'm you know I'm going to give you sort of s s just a little hint as to what you can do uh, with the DOS and the band structure, um, but we're not going to go into great detail. But you can find those details in many places online and in books. And if you come to me, I'm happy to talk about these concepts that we'll talk about. So the plan so the plan is we're going to do a little bit of review, case base, feeling good about oneness, all that. And then I want to um, show you that, um, that problem. We'll talk about just one band structure problem that I happened to give last year on the exam. And then we'll, do some, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some properties, uh, electron transport, a couple minutes. And then we'll talk about magnetization. And then we'll do some calculations together again, because I think that's been really enjoyable. Actually, seriously, I mean, I always enjoy calculating together. But do you feel like, uh, how many of you feel like that's useful to do some simulations here in class? One, two, more? OK, OK. Because I think, you know, please ask questions. You know, that's like, this is the time, you know? Because um, this is where we can, if you have any questions, please stop and say, like, I got no idea what you're talking about. Like, that's OK. I love those. You know, that's, that's what I want to hear. Well, that's actually not what I want to hear. But if I hear it, it's fine. You know, that helps me to, to know sort of where, where we need to have a little discussion. OK. Now, this is the concept that we have to be, uh, we have to be really good, good in our understanding with. This is really the key of this um, sort of second part of the second part, if you want, of the class, which is we did quantum. We did quantum for atoms. We did quantum for molecules. And now it's all about solids. And the big difference is that you, when, you, when you have a solid, you have you know, over and over and over again the same atom 
or same couple of atoms in your basis, and therefore the same potential that the electron feels. And over and over again, how many times? If I had to give a number. Yeah. Couple thousand. Well, I'd say more like a couple 10 to the 23rd thousands, 10 to the 23rds. Um, that's how, right? I mean, if I take a piece of material, you know, like this big, you know, this big, um, you know, that's how, well, even this big, even really tiny, you got like, you know, 10 to the 23rd repeats of this potential. That's a lot. So it's almost infinite. Um, and when you have that kind of periodically repeating well that the electron feels, something happens, OK? And, and the something that happens was this mathematical thing that, who can remember what it's called? A th it, it was a theorem, I believe. Bloch's theorem. theorem. And we don't, know how, we don't need to know much about Bloch's theorem except the end game. Right? The key is what it means. And it's a mathematical um, consequence. It's a consequence of having a, an electron and therefore its solution being a wave function that solves the Schrodinger equation. It's a consequence of having that in the context of a periodic potential. Right? You can't get around it. It's a theorem. So, you you got to have now this, because of Bloch's theorem, you got to have this sort of requirement, if you want to think about it as a requirement, that when the wave function repeats, okay, the properties just repeat. The density is the same here as it is here as it is here, 10 to the 23rd out. But when the wave function repeats, it picks up this phase, okay? And that phase is, is a vector, is a number that lives in k-space, that lives in the inverse space. And that's why we spent all that time talking about what inverse space is, what reciprocal space is, right? what k-space is. Okay? And that phase is, um, it, it's, you can think about it as another quantum number. So uh, um, the result of solving the Schrodinger equation and getting psi in a periodic potential gives you a new number. But it's very different than these numbers, right? How is it different? Yeah. OK. Yeah? Right. These are like 1 or 2 or 1, 2, 0, minus 1. Um, whereas this is like a, a part of a, a place in space. And what else is really interesting about that vector? It's in reciprocal space. Absolutely. Nice job. I, I'll, you guys did that together, totally. Team effort, man. I love it. And what about, what about, uh, what else? It's a vector in reciprocal space. What else? OK, well, it, it doesn't have to be, but we said it doesn't really matter if you go outside of it, because you just loop back. But what about its variation in the Brillouin zone? How can it vary? Yeah. Like, this is a vector that can be anything. This thing can be anything. These things, can they be anything? Can L be pi or square root of 2? Right? So it's a different kind of quantum number. But you see, it has the same impact. Right? Because, I mean, what do these things do? Right? Like, what, is, what does this do, anyway? What's one of the things that this does? Or this. What does L do when I change L? from you know, 0 to 1, what's one of the things that happens? Yeah, yeah, OK, so let's, let's write that down. So we're moving from s, well, let's change n up to here, to s, 1s, 2s. And now you just said I'm moving to p. Now, what, what, what is this that I'm always just assuming you know is what that vertical axis is? What is it? So this is the energy going from lowest to highest, exactly. And so what did changing the quantum number L from 0 to 1 do? Or, yeah, it moves it around, right? 
It moves it around. Okay, so you can change the energy, and actually you can also not change the energy. M doesn't change the energy. It gives degeneracy, right? But, but certainly you can change the energy by changing these quantum numbers. Um, that's what you can do with K, right? That's what K does. K, which is a result of living in a periodically repeating world, K changes the levels. It cha it's the same idea, but it's very different, but it has the same impact. It changes these levels around. And it's very different because it can do it continuously, as opposed to these you know, big leaps that, um, that we have in the atom, OK? Or in the molecule. I mean, the molecule, there are also um, discrete levels. And so we got this picture that we came to last time where you see k can be a vector. And it can live anywhere in this inverse space. OK? And any time you change it, you may change the energy levels. You may change them. OK? So it's a really important thing when you have a solid. Now, it, you know, again, how, how would you, if, if I had a solid, but if, if I have a periodic, periodically repeating atom, but the distance between them is like 100 angstroms, what's the variation in these? What's the impact of k going to be? We did it in class. Relatively small. Like, Almost nothing. Because the whole effect comes from the fact that you have an electron in a lattice of periodic images where they're uh, periodic potentials where they're sort of interacting, right? Where they're close enough that there's some interaction. If there's no interaction and your atoms are really, really far apart, okay, then it's basically like you just have isolated atoms sitting in their potentials and a whole lot of empty space in between. And then the levels will just look flat as a function of k space. Doesn't mean you can't vary k. You could still vary k. But the bands that you get will be completely flat. They'll go back to your molecular level uh, description. So does everybody see that? Right. And we talked about that. And so then the question was, well, what playground of K matters? OK, and this is, um, this is uh, uh, something we talked about, but it's really important. So I want to review it here. OK, so we just said that K is this new index that is a continuous variable that changes the energy levels. It moves them around. OK, so what does that mean? for a calculation, right? Well, one thing that it means is that when I do a calculation, um, I need a, if, if a, if an energy level, if an energy level can now do this, right, as a function of k, then that means I need to actually do my calculation with a mesh of k points. How fine a mesh do I need? What's the answer to that? Depends. Thank you. On what? How curvy your bands are. Yeah. How curvy are my bands? This is pretty curvy. So maybe I need a lot of K points to capture this. Because if I don't, it's, you know, you got a grid. I'm solving for this problem on a grid of K points, basically. And if I only have a k point here and here, well, let's say I have it actually even worse. I have it here and here. I'm not going to really um, capture the right physics here. Okay. So the density of k points has to be such that you capture the the features of in in terms of how much these energy levels vary. So let's go back to these two atoms that are very far apart. How many k points do I need for those? What if they're really far apart? One. 
All, whoa, all the calculations you've been doing until we did the solids, everything before that was actually one K point. It was at zero, zero, zero. We never varied it, right? We never worried about it. It was never a problem. It was never an index. Okay, so now if, if the bands are flat, you could just have one K point and you've got the variation of the bands nailed since they don't vary. So you just need the one. But if they vary a lot, like if I bring atoms together and they vary a lot and there's a lot of interaction, then I just need more and more K points to represent that correctly. Okay, so, so the K points is, is, a, is something that's now an essential part of your calculation. Now, that's, that's talking about what you need to get the density right, which is to get the wave function right, which is to get the energy levels right. Okay? That's a new you know, component of a quantum mechanical simulation. But then there was this other thing that's actually kind of a little bit separate in a way, okay? which is um, to visualize that variation. Okay? Now, visualizing this variation leads to these plots, which are called band structures. This is the band structure of the material. It's like, uh, oh, it's like a, uh, you know, it's another kind of phase map for, for those of you who felt the excitement of phase diagrams in 3012. This is like a phase map for that electron, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's a really important um, uh, uh, description, right, of how electrons behave in materials. Now, this phase map, is not, everything going okay over there? I look, I, <laughs> it looked like you got hurt. No, you're good. Okay, all right. I got a little concerned, but we're over it. Um, the, uh, the, <laughs> the fa <laughs> sorry, the phase map, okay, is a walk through K space. Now, I just mentioned that you have a grid that you just have to put on here to do the calculation to get the wiggles that may or may not be there. Well, you should take a guess at whether you think they're there, and then you should see, and then you should converge it. Okay. But now I'm taking a walk around in that zone. And the question is, where am I going to go? I mean, should I just go to E? I mean, well, I, I'm using 4 by 4 by 4 K points. So I'm using a grid of 64 points. And I'm plopping it down into this Brillouin zone. Should I just map? Should I just look at the energies at each of those points? Well, you could do that, right? I mean, ideally, you'd like to be able to visualize this variation all over K space at every single point, OK? But, uh, why don't we do that? Tell me why we don't usually do that. Well, that is true, but that's more of a kind of density thing. So that's where you'd want to know the density, the isosurface of the charge density. Yeah? OK, that's definitely, that's definitely true, but let's say you didn't know that. What if I, you know, I, I mean, I'd like to do the most accurate calculation possible. Let's say I put a grid over this case space of like a million by a million by a million. Don't do that on the NanoHub. We'll get calls. <laughs> um, but let's say I did that. Now, I've got a million by a million by a million points in here where each point has a new set of energy, you know, eigenvalues. Why can't I just visualize that? Yeah. Would it just take too long to simulate? Well, it would take a whole lot of time to simulate. What about visualizing it, though? How would you visualize that? But see, it's not even really just 3D, right? Because at each one of these points, I've got a spectrum of energies, right? So it's kind of like, yeah, it's making your it would be making your 
eigenvalues, each one into a 3D curve. And I want to look at them all, right? Uh, you could do that, you, you know, but how, you know, you got to remember, if I go down to here, I'm not, you can't just do it within this volume element, right? My eigenvalues might shift up, down, sideways, you know, not sideways, up, down, um, in different ways depending on where I am. How am I actually going to see that, right? So, you know, in a way what we have is actually a strong visualization challenge that um, luckily there's sort of a good story here because luckily um, we can just look at a 2D map of this variation and get all the information we need, okay, for almost all materials. And so how do you get a 2D map? Well, then instead of doing like the whole of volume, you just walk through the volume along lines. You literally just walk along this line and then this line and then down and then back and then up. And as you're doing this walk through k-space, you plot the energy bands and you connect them together. And you draw lines between those, you know, those connections. This is the same energy level just moving around along that walk. Okay? So that seems like uh, an oversimplification because I'm not going through the whole Brillouin zone by any means. I'm just going through very particular lines in there. And yet, it's all we need. And the reason is that um, most of the things I want to know about a material, most of the things I want to know are going to come from the, the variation between, in these bands, between high symmetry points in k-space. Okay? So I can go to other points in the Brillouin zone and I'll get other levels. I'll get you know, a different set of levels. Um, but it's probably not going to add to my knowledge of the material and the properties that I can get. So, for example, you know, I'm very interested in this, where this has a maximum, the valence band, and where the conduction band has a minimum, right? And you'll notice the minimum for silicon is actually not at this high symmetry point X, but it does come along the path to X from another high symmetry point gamma. It came along that path. And there's no place in k-space that gives me a lower point, you see. So I nailed the thing I needed. I nailed it by going from one high symmetry point to another. And that's what a band diagram is. It's a, it's a walk through k-space along lines between high symmetry points. And that gives you the map that you need. And it's a really nice, these sometimes look really complicated, but just think it's saving you a whole lot of trouble and, you know, compared to all the data you actually could have. But it's giving you what you need. Are there any uh, questions about that? It's kind of sort of the key point here from this um, band structure. And we talked about how um, you, uh, you know, we, we've talked about this, how you, you get your bands just like in an atom or a molecule you get your energy levels from solving the Schrodinger equation, and then you fill them up, right? Using the Pauli exclusion rule, right? Um, add a little bit of Hund's rule to it, although that can be violated. Don't tell anyone. Um, and uh, and you fill them up, and then you're done. And when you're done, you've got your Fermi energy. Okay. Um, that that's now it's the same exact thing here in the band structure. Okay. You you fill your bands up until you you filled them up with the number of electrons that you had in your simulation, okay? And uh, then you've got your Fermi energy, and then if there's a small gap there and no bands cross it, it cannot be a what? It cannot be a? A, a metal. It can be a conductor. It can be a conductor, a semiconductor, or a really bad insulating conductor, also known as an insulator. But it can't be a metal, right? Because if, if no bands cross, if there's a gap here between where you filled to and the next place, then it's not a metal, OK? 
So we talked about that. Um, and that's uh, uh, certainly if you have an odd number of electrons, it has to be a metal. Okay. Um, and there's a calculation. I showed this last time uh, of an insulator. And we, we also talked about how these, um, this density of states okay, is another really important thing here. And since this is in your homework as well, in your current PSET, um, now I'll get to transport in a sec. Um, I want to make sure we know what density of states is. Okay. Um, so what would the density of states of the, um, somebody tell me what the density of states of the carbon atom would look like. Okay, so let's, let's draw, so we had the carbon atom would have 1s and 2s and 2p, and how many would I put here? Okay, and what about the next one? Okay, I'm liking it, and here? Two. Two. Okay, like that. Oh, oh, wait, hold on. Okay, thank you, like this. Oh, sorry, all right. That would be an open, open shell signalet. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, um, okay. So, what's my what's my density of states of this? How do I do it? Okay. Yeah. So, I'm seeing people go like this. So, this now. So, this was energy here, and now this is going to be energy here. Okay. What's my next step? Drawing a curve. Okay. I'm going to draw a curve. What is that? That's 1s. Why not? I've just broadened it. We'll make that 1s. And what's my next curve I want to draw? OK, sure. And it should be spaced such that it is, um, it is about, you know, it should be the right energy spacing that I get from my quantum mechanical simulations. OK. And what's next? To P. Let's make this go out further. OK, now 2p. Now, how should I do this? Should I make it the same? Shift it down. Same. Is it different than 2s? Well, let's see. I mean, I had two electrons in each of these. How many electrons could go into 2p? Six. Six. Right, so I actually have more states there. I have three times as many as here. So in a way, if you're thinking about these as sort of a vertical line, OK, that is, um, that, that is spread out by some smoothing function just to make it into a nice pretty curve, <clears throat> I mean, if it's an atom, if it's really an atom, then it's really a, just a line. It's a delta function. Okay. Um, but then this should have three lines all on top of each other, right? And so if, if I look at that, it's going to lead to a, a, a bigger peak, right? That has, you know, more area under it, right? Three times as much, yeah. OK. So you can, you can fit six electrons into this peak. This is what the density of states is, right? It is uh, the density of states. <laughs> um, it is these levels. It's these levels. OK? Does everybody see that? Now, where's my Fermi energy for the carbon atom? Is it over here? Here? It feels like it should be here, right? We like Fermi energies between peaks, but that's just because we like semiconductors. No, we like metals too, and insulators. They're all good. So where should it be? Does this sound good? Over here? Mm -hmm. Somebody tell me when to stop. <laughs> Somebody say stop. Yeah. OK, now why am I stopping here? So that's my Fermi energy for the carbon atom. Why is it there? Well, it's an atom. So let's not think about it necessarily as conducting. 
That's the definition, right? I mean, here I, here I filled and I stopped. Well, yeah, so here I filled and I stopped, and here I filled and I stopped. And what uh, the gentleman over there said is, it's where you stop filling, right? And so here is where I stopped filling, because I had this peak of states, right? It's a peak of states, the density of states, that is only filled by two electrons, right? Does everybody see that? Right, so, it, you know, so if I had um, um, something else, like, say, neon, would my Fermi energy be inside the peak? No. Just outside of it. Because I would have filled it, right? Yeah. Um, besides the change in the location of the Fermi energy, would, like, the density of states be, like, it look the same for, like, nitrogen? Is it it's a very good question. It would, actually, in the sense that, you know, if you're looking at atoms, all you're really doing, you know, a density of states is a little bit of an odd thing for an atom. But I'm trying to explain it in the context of atoms because I really want you guys to see the connection, okay, and really what's, what it is. Um, but it, if you look at atoms, they're just, they're nothing more than levels. And those discrete levels, okay, become little shapes that you broaden a little. So it would look the same as nitrogen because in nitrogen, you would have that. Now, what does that do? Well, it'll change these energy level positions. It'll shift them around, right? This may even change. The 1s may go down or up. This may change a little. And then here, you're going to change not the peak, because you still got six states and you know, you still got six electrons you can put in there. But you will change the Fermi energy within the peak, because you can fill it by one more. OK? Um, so. And, you know, just like going all the way back to our first or second lecture, where we had the orbitals of, hydro of the hydrogen atom, okay? So we had the, the nucleus and we had this electron that does not orbit. But there it is orbiting. And then we had like the 1s and then we had like the 2s. And remember how we talked about it can actually make transitions between the two without actually existing between the two. Right? There are sometimes it has to cross paths which are totally forbidden. It's so, sort of exciting. It's like some sort of interesting fiction, right? That this electron is going on an adventure. And well, that's what this is, right? There is no state in here in this energy. So the DOS tells you that too, right? That is what's in the DOS. That information is contained in the DOS. There cannot be an electron with an energy that where there's no DOS. There's no states to support it there, OK? So you know, for an atom, like the hydrogen atom or the carbon atom as well, that's fairly obvious, because you had your levels and you knew it couldn't be in between those levels. That's the quantization stuff we talked about. But now when you, you, you get to solids, and it's a more messy picture, right? But it's the same understanding that you get out of it. It's the same exact understanding. So what you do for you know, atom, molecule, or solid is you take your levels, you take your levels, and you turn them over, and you count up the number of states, right? And, and that, that has to be the same. And you get shapes to the DOS. If it was an atom, I just had these little lines here from the levels, and I broadened them. Now. The levels are no longer flat. If it's a solid, they can vary. And that, when you turn that, that on its side, it can be like really kind of different, right? But it's telling you the same thing. It's telling you exactly the same thing. You're filling your electrons up through here, and you're stopping. Well, I don't know. Is that the Fermi energy? I didn't tell you. But if it is, then you're stopping there. And those are your unoccupied bands and so forth. OK, does everybody see that? It's the same, uh, same idea. But it's more complicated when you have these curviness is. Yeah. Right? We good? Sort of? Any questions? Thoughts? Yeah. So when you're looking at allotropic systems, so in case you have done I'm assuming that the graphite, this system would be 
completely, completely different. And so, how, and so how does that tie to solve the density of states? It's, you can write the density of states for any material. And, and the same uh, concept always holds, right? That you have these accessible places where the electron can be with some probability of them being there, right? Um, in other words, it, it, it's all about how many possible energy levels you, you have as a function of energy. I mean, that's really what it is. And so, you know, whatever material you have, the, the density of states is, is, is simply has the same meaning, but it will look very different. And in diamond, you're going to get a big band gap, and in graphite, well, it's a metal, right? You have a crossing. In graphene, you have a crossing um, at one part in the band structure. It goes right through the what would have been the gap, OK? Um, and, you know, and that's why when you do your homework, uh, when you do piece at 5, the, the, you know, there are sort of two ways I want you to think about how these molecules absorb light. One way is that they just have some cutoff below which in energy or above which in wavelength they cannot absorb light. So that's just a single cutoff. But the other way is to actually use the features in this, in this uh, uh, plot of levels of accessible states for the electrons to use this information and, and weight the absorption of the sun by this, because that's actually what's really going on, OK? Is that th the molecule cannot absorb the same at all the wavelengths of light, because in some places, it can't absorb any light, right? In some parts of the DOS, there's no probability. So that's, um, that turns out to have a really big impact. Right. OK. Questions? Thoughts? Now let me, um, before I go on, it's OK. I, I thought maybe we'd have time to, do, to look at uh, an intro to solar, but that would have been ahead anyway. Oh, wait, no? Where is the view? Huh. That's not looking very good. I had a nice, uh, what I thought was a nice example of a problem. No. Hang on one second. Um, oh boy, never show anyone your desktop in a presentation. That's a bad idea. Um, but anyway, oh, final quiz. Yeah, that's from last year. Yeah, don't worry, it's, not, it's in a very safe location for this year. Actually, it's very unsafe. It's up here. <laughs> anyway, uh, wait, where did it go? Ah, why can't I see it? Here we go. OK, that's the problem I wanted to talk about. OK, so this was a problem from last year's quiz. And um, we, OK, so your advisor has just spilled coffee on the culmination of your entire summer UROP work. This is not a true story. <laughs> uh, the prediction of the band structure of an amazing new material for solar cells. Unfortunately, in your excitement to show your work, you forgot to back up your data. You dropped your computer in a hot tub, and you forgot everything you did. <laughs> so you only have that one printout now stained with coffee. Can you believe it? This is what you got. Nothing else. OK? Was this material? You want to put it back together because you know it was 4 in the morning. You had had a lot of no-dos. But still, you're pretty sure you remember it was going to change the whole field of solar. Okay. Now, from this, was this material a metal, a semiconductor, or an insulator? Tell me why. Really? Seriously? Yeah. Doesn't look like the bands are crossing. 
Um, it looks like the tallest pen gap is just under zero. I could, can't really tell. And then it doesn't look like the pen gap for the balance is crossing either. Doesn't I look did, like it. Different. Can you can you be certain? No. In fact, it's also a solar cell. Well, you do need metal, and you know maybe it was a, a revolution in the contact, in the metal contact. That wouldn't revolution. <laughs> that wouldn't revolutionize solar PV, but still. Um, again, see, we're inclined to want to connect these things up. Right? We're sort of used to staring at silicon, and we think that's going to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't know that you have enough information here. OK? I'm not sure you know enough about this to know that this band didn't actually split, and one of them crossed up and went this way. Right? How do you know? Now, there is one thing you know it's not. There's one of those three you know it's not. Not an insulator. Why not? Because you can make out at least that much that these bands, you know, they're about an EV or two apart. They may be closer. They may overlap. But it's not going to be an insulator, right? But you can't tell. Right? This is a little bit of a tricky question. Um, you seem to remember that the material would absorb light very efficiently. Reconstruct the band structure plot that would correspond to such a material. What are you supposed to do here? Yeah. For all band structures that's associated with some wavelength or, or region of wavelengths of light. OK, you could certainly do that. And, but now, um, and you know, in a way, any band structure you know, above the band gap is associated with the region of light. Because and except for the band gap, below which you cannot absorb light. right? As soon as you start having states, you can absorb light. Now, but the key is here. It absorbs light very efficiently. So what do I need to do in here? Yeah. You got to put a direct band gap in there somehow. That's the key. So you got to reconstruct this. And it didn't matter to me where. And there were all kinds of really creative curves people drew. right? But somewhere in here, maybe this is going to come down a little and then go down here, right? And then maybe come in like here, where you can't see, um, you know? But somehow, you've got to try to make this a direct band gap material, right? It's actually pretty hard, because the stain doesn't give you a lot of room. But it's actually, that mirrors how hard it is to do that for silicon in real life. The stain and silicon are deeply connected. <laughs> One minute later, you realize that actually it didn't absorb light efficiently at all. But instead, it was a revolutionary metal electrode. Now what would you draw? Right. Okay. You, you'd cross it up. You'd draw, maybe you'd try to get a lot of wiggles in here if you could, or just certainly several crossings, right? so that the electrons can kind of you know, don't really see any gap. You can't see a gap. Okay? So that's kind of a, a nice you know, problem for um, and you can see it's not, you know, there's not, it's not a very long problem, but it does, you got to know a few things to answer the question about th these sorts of uh, topics. Okay, so we'll do another one of those uh, next Tuesday or two. Um, okay, now let's talk about, uh, wait, where am I here? Let's talk about a few other properties that you can calculate. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of transport, but this is sort of basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, double E or, you know, basic physics stuff. If you put an electron in a field, it's going to push it with a force. And so the F equals MA of that. Yeah? Uh, I have a question. Please. Um, yeah, greater than the gap. Uh, for what application? For solar cells? Uh, yeah, sure. So that's a very good point. And why, who can tell me why you can't have a too low of a gap? And, and I'll talk about this as we move into solar PV. But barriers not high enough and they keep popping over? What? That wouldn't necessarily be a problem. Yeah. 
you know, probably get saturated with, uh, with lower energy. And what's wrong with that, though? Well, that's, that's, that's what it is. is it, it actually is what sets the potential of the cell. So this goes back to, and it's a very good question, right? Why not just use the lowest gap possible, right? And then you'll absorb all the light, or most of the light. Well, the reason is that it goes back to this picture that when you're, when you're taking photons and making them into electrons, what you're really doing is you're, you know, it's, it's again, it's that pumping water analogy. You're, you're giving the electrons energy and pushing them up a hill. Now. Um, in the solar fuels case, we're using that push to change the molecule's configuration to store energy. In the solar cell case, we're using that push to, to get just energy, voltage out, right? And um, if I, you know, so I, I'd like to not get just a teeny, teeny bit of voltage, right? I'd like to get, get it up a hill. Now, if I try to you know, push it, if I, if I make my gam, ban, band gap such that I push it, can only push it really, really high, you might think you want that. But then what happens? Doesn't absorb any light, right? So now you have these two competing effects. Small band gap. To absorb the light. Yeah. Larger band gap to give you more potential for your cell. Large band gap, more potential, small band gap. Small potential. Less, but, but more light. And there's a sweet spot. Okay, and I'll talk about that. As I, I'll talk about that a little bit on Tuesday. Okay, that that is uh, uh, competing two competing attributes of solar PV that limit, um, you know, how much energy you can you can get from the sun. Um, now, the the so if you put an electron in a field, it's going to move until it hits until you sort of hit this equilibrium point where. The acceleration, you know, is is zero because it's, um, you know, the force it feels is balanced by the scattering. Okay, that's sort of basic um, transport, electron transport equations, and so you can get an equation for the drift velocity of the electron, or the thing that we care about a lot is this electrical conductivity, right? Something that you can measure, which is nothing more than the drift velocity times the number density. That, that's actually a hard thing to separate out, but it can be done in experiment, okay? Um, and so the current is, is that, and, and it's equal to the connect, electrical conductivity times the field. Now, here's the thing. That is actually, um, that equation then, if you just look at these very simple sort of F equals MA for an electron in a field, that very simply comes down to this equation. And here's the thing, that mass, Okay, what we want now is, well, what's the electron uh, conductivity in the solid? What's the electron conductivity in the solid? And it turns out that that mass that's on the previous page, that M, it, it becomes a kind of effective mass of the electron um, that can be different than just the mass of the electron, the standard mass of the electron. The reason is that it's in this periodic crystal. Remember, you know, the, the electron is going to feel this very strange um, environment when it's in a periodic crystal, and it's going to feel differences in its energy band, and that changes, what that does is it changes actually the effective mass of the electron as it's in different parts of K-space, okay? Well, it turns out that that effective mass is directly related to the, this curvature. This, if you look at, um, I'm just rewriting the previous equation, but now I'm putting in the band structure here. These little v's are nothing more than the slope of E in the band structure, the slope of the energy in the band structure versus k, OK? Um, and so. So, what, so this is called effective mass approximation. It's an approximation, but it's a pretty good one. The electron feels a kind of different weight to it. It's heavy or light. Think about it that way. Depending on whether it's in a flat part of the band where it's really heavy, or whether it's in a curvy part of the band where it's kind of feeling more light and bouncy. Okay? And that changes the, uh, the conductivity. Right, that can be measured. And that, so this is a really nice way 
just from the curvature of these bands, it's a really nice way of getting a sense of how mobile an electron or hole is in a material. All you have to do is you just take an integral over the second derivative of this, uh, or the derivative of that, the, the slope, basically, as you go along k space there. OK? Does anybody, so does anybody know what a Fermi function is? It's just a weight. But is it, yeah? How many of you know, don't know what a Fermi function is? It's, OK. So it's basically, you know, this, is, this comes from Fermi-Dirac statistics. It's not um, in any way critical here. But it, it's an occupation function. It's saying that at a given temperature, you're likely to have uh, electrons or not um, at, at a certain energy. And so the Fermi function, you know, at zero temperature, F is going to look like this, where this would be 1. And this, well, this would be 0. But then, as, and the Fermi function is uh, 1 over e to the um, e minus ef divided by kt uh, plus 1, OK? Where e is where you are in the band structure. E is where you are in the band structure. And you're looking at this as you go above the Fermi energy. Can electrons be there? Well, at zero temperature, no. right? But actually, when you go to some finite temperature, just temperature alone can kick electrons up, can kick electrons up. Okay, That's what the Fermi function is, is in that equation for. Um, because at some temperature, you can actually have a distribution that looks more like this. T equals 0, T equals something. Now, what, what's important here? Well, what's important is that w you know, when you think about um, conductivity, you want to know, you, gotta, you see, the difference here between you know, drift velocity and current or conductivity is that you got to know something about how many carriers you have. OK? Um, and that's going to be temperature dependent. Does everybody see that? That's why this is important. Now, but what if my Fermi function is like this? And OK, let's say I have silicon. And I'm going to now plot on top of this, um, I'm going to use a different color, and plot on top of this the density of states. OK? And let's say my density of states was like this. OK, I don't know if it is or not. And then here's the band gap. This is my DOS. That doesn't look like a different color at all. It's not even close. It's like they painted it yellow on the outside. And seriously, it's totally white. All right, anyway, so, um, so here's my Fermi function. I'm at room temperature, and this is my distribution of electrons. OK, here's the, um, you know, here's the, uh, this is the gap. Tell me what's going on here. Somebody explain this to me. Yeah, Sam? Like, even though there's a probability that you could have electrons in that space, because there's no space for them to go, I love it. That's absolutely right. You cannot have electrons there. The Fermi function says I can. In your face, Fermi function, says the DOS. I didn't say that. I would never say that to a Fermi function. But the DOS said it. The DOS said, uh-uh. <laughs> we got zero probability here, man. You can't be here. So the DOS said, no states, no deal. Go away. So the Fermi function tried. It said, hey, I got enough energy from temperature to give you a few electrons. And the DOS says, I don't want them. Because they're not at the energy where I've got any states. Right? Now, what can I do then to populate the conduction band of silicon? What can I do? More thermal energy. I'm going to run my solar cell 
at 10,000 degrees. Well, you could, you'll get more and more, and you will start to get electrons in there. But actually, that's not always practical. So what is, how do we get electrons into there? Then there are other reasons electrons come into those states. You know, but, but what, not just from thermal. Um, but what's one way that we can get electrons in there? Yeah. What does doping do? Well, it can change the Fermi energy, but I, what might I dope silicon with? Phosphorus? Why? Excess electron uh, compared to silicon. Now, if I have an excess electron sitting in my crystal, then is it, you know, and, and but really the crystal is still kind of silicon y because I don't have many of these excess electrons. I just have one phosphorus atom every thousand. So it's really still silicon. Then, but I filled all my electrons up to here. And now I've got one extra. Where does it go? Goes in there. And now I'm populating it without thermal energy, right? I don't need to work with my Fermi function. I did it chemically. I put an, I put an atom in there that had a spare electron, right? And that is actually, in fact, exactly what happens in, in, you know, in real materials. Who knows what it's called when you have an extra electron or an excess of electrons? n type. Now, what if I wanted holes? What if I wanted extra holes? p type. And what would I put in there? Boron. Because? Unless electron. Now, you could, you could dope it with many other things. You don't have to dope silicon with just you know, uh, phosphorus or boron. It turns out that those are easy, and, and there are some advantages in terms of the processing. And you know, chemically, they can be happy. But there are many ways of doping materials, many, many ways of doping materials. And one of the things you do with doping, there are many things you do with doping, but one of the things you do is you get electrons or holes into these bands. You populate them, right? But this expression is ignoring that. This is just saying, well, we're going to use, we're going to see if there's some thermal uh, uh, energy there, and we'll use that. Okay. Yeah. Any questions about that? Now um, we talked about this a lot, so I, I'm not going to go over this again. That you know, the direct transitions are easy for photons. Um, the indirect ones where you shift the k, where you are in k space, are hard. Okay, um, and that is why silicon is an expensive solar cell. So we've we've talked about this. I don't want to belabor the point because I want to try to get to some simulations, if possible. Any questions about that point though? The optical transitions. Right. So the kinds of things you can get. Well, you can get optical properties, right? Um, and you can also get magnetic properties from these densities of states. So we talked about the optical properties. And the optical properties is really the, the, the context of your, um, you know, of your PSET 5, but it's for a molecule. Um, we haven't talked about magnetism, and I want to come back to it, because I did mention that electrons have spin. And therefore, um, they also have a magnetic moment. And we call this, just think of it as some constant that we call the Bohr magneton. It has a value. OK. Um, well, and if you think about like an atom or a molecule, you could just get that by knowing how many electrons are spinning in one direction more than the other, right? So you can just count how many spin up electrons minus how many spin down electrons um, you have and multiply that by the Bohr magneton. And that'll give you the magnetic moment of the atom or molecule. But what would I do for a solid? So just like, just like um, do I still have it? Yeah. See, there's, a, there's the atomic picture where I could just count. And in this case, the difference is three. right? But now I've got a solid. So what do I want to do? I want to, what, what do I want to look at for a solid? Density of states. 
And it turns out that you can plot the density of states for spin up and spin down electrons separately. And they can be different. They can occupy those, uh, the two spins differently in a more complicated way, but very much kind of same idea as what can happen in an atom. But it's more complicated as you get these curvy bands and, and all kinds of other things that can happen in a solid. So now you look at the separate density of states for electrons with spin up versus spin down. And that is something that I didn't talk about yet. It's an input parameter in siesta that is checked yes by default. And it's called spin polarized, question mark, I think is what it's called. Spin polarized? I should give the right intonation. And you say yes or no. And you say yes, because that's the default. But what are you doing when you say yes? Well, what you're doing is you're telling the calculation to, to allow the up and down electrons to have freedom from one another. OK? That's actually critical. So if you didn't do that, you would be simulating the material with the constraint that the up and down electrons are exactly at the same energies. OK? So spin polarized, it's, it's a, it's a, the reason you do uh, calculations that are not spin polarized is because many systems don't have a difference between up and down electrons, right? And, and they are actually all the same, right? I mean, you know, if I looked at, if I filled this up, what do I have if I fill this up? Oh. What atom is that? It's neon. And here, every up electron is the same as every down electron for a given state, right? Everything is the same here. So it's not like this up electron of this p orbital wanted to be there, and the down one wanted to be there. That doesn't happen for neon. And it doesn't happen for many systems and many materials. But for certainly in some cases, and certainly for magnetic materials, that's what causes magnetism, right? It's that you have a difference between spin up and spin down. And that as you occupy the density of states, you literally you get a difference in, in the number. right? So that's what causes the magnetism. So for, for many materials, you know, there is no spin polarization. Or, there, or in other words, there is no difference. They, they're just spin up and spin down is the same here, same here, same here. right? But if it's a magnetic material, what you'll find is that if you plot the density of states separately for spin up and spin down electrons, like in this case for, for iron, there's a difference. And in fact, the magnetic moment of that material is nothing more than the integral of that difference. Right? Again, you're integrating the DOS, and you're finding something really cool about the material. Okay, So that's the same thing as just counting number of up and number of down, but now you're counting it in, in this very sort of complex filling of states you know, that happens in a material. OK? Any questions? So if I, if I did a calculation of iron with spin polarized checked no, then um, you see, these would be identical, and I'd get no magnetism. OK, and you can do that. You can actually do the calculation of iron with spin polarized check no, and it's completely wrong. It's not the ground state of iron, right? Um, and, but, and if you do it with spin polarized on, then it allows those up and down electrons to move relative to each other. And you'll get uh, the code will, the outputs, you'll see that there's a, in the plots, there's something called the projected density of states, and it's projected for one spin and another spin, OK? And that would allow you to, um, to calculate the magnetic properties of materials using the, the NanoHub tool. And I think last year we did do, uh, we might have done a homework on that, but this year we, we won't. But I want you to know about it, because it's, it's kind of cool, OK? Um, any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, couple other things you can do. And, and I, I, you know, these are just, I just briefly want to, first principles, right, quantum molecular dynamics, you can do it. You can do MD just like you did 
MD in the first part. You're just getting F from uh, Hellman Feynman, the Hellman Feynman theorem, which I sort of referred to a couple lectures ago. Um, but it's basically just a way of getting the forces um, using quantum mechanics. And, and I don't really want to go into it in detail, but I just want to tell you, you can get the force on these atoms from these quantum mechanical si simulations. And you can do dynamics. Here's one I did a long time ago. And here the problem was that how do nanotubes grow was, was a big question, OK? And so what we did is, you know, now, what you have is you have a piece of iron here. And w this is what happens when you, when you grow nanotubes, is you have these seed particles, like iron, right? It can be other things, nickel, other things will work, um, not gold. Uh, and, and then you flow some kind of gas over it that dumps carbon onto the catalyst, OK? Now, the, the, the problem is that understanding how that then leads to the growth of a tube is, a, is still an open question. By the way, still an open question. Nobody actually really knows the full answer to that. But certainly, people were just debating, does the carbon go inside the, the catalyst or not? Does it stay on the surface? Does it saturate the catalyst first and then come out you know, from the, the bulk, from the particle? And that, that's, a really, that's a perfect problem for quantum because there's so many different bonding environments and so many possibilities here that classical potentials will fail. Okay? They're not going to capture all of the different you know, complexities in how carbon needs to bond to iron inside and out. And so it's a great problem for quantum mechanics. And we studied this and showed, you know, we, we fed the simulation carbon, and we just watched sort of how the tube um, winds up making its way uh, out of the system, and we showed that it doesn't saturate actually inside the iron, but rather stays on the surface. Now, one, uh, and it makes for cool movies. Um, yeah, I don't know how long it's going to. So, somebody tell me something you notice about this, um, besides just, you know, it's kind of a fun movie, but do you notice anything? Like, there's the initial nanotube growth, and that's where it ended. So I noticed two things. Yeah. Some rings are more than six carbons. Oh yeah, actually that's that's a really good point. So so that was a you know very interesting part of the analysis is what kinds what kind of carbon you get, right? When you catalyze carbon on a surface, um, what does it do? Right? Does it form nice graphene and then curve it, or does it form the defects so that you can curve it? Where are the penalties in energy coming from? But actually, I was going to say I was going to kind of say some negative things. Two negative things. They're not negatives, but they're limitations. Tell me something obvious about this compared to, say, the protein simulations you did in the first part. Yeah. This is really tiny. And how long do you think this went? What is that? Uh, I'm not going to tell you, because that would make me feel old. Um, a while ago. <laughs> uh, well, so, you know, but. Anyway, how long can you run a molecular dynamic simulation having to do quantum mechanics at each step? Yeah, like, uh, well, how long could you do proteins in, with classical MD? Huge systems, for, well, could you do them for seconds? No, but how long? Yeah, actually even longer. It, with classical MD, you can get up to microseconds now. Certainly nanoseconds is, is, is you know, 10, 100 nanoseconds, no problem. Here we're at, we're at 10 picoseconds, right? even 2 picoseconds. Nowadays, you can push 50, 100 picoseconds, but you wouldn't go further than that. It's really hard. Right? So the time and size are real, really limited. Um, and that's why we, you know, with, with quantum MD, you study small systems <laughs> for short time scales. This was nanocluster growth. Um, the other thing I, I want to, you know, I, I think quantum, these are just kind of other things you can do. This is supposed to be, you know, just making sure you see that it's not just the band structure in DOS. There are other things. You can do a lot of things with quantum simulations. Um, water is, is, is a really cool problem. And um, I, I love Cavendish. I love reading about Cavendish. Has anybody read about Cavendish? He's such a fascinating guy. Um, He's a university dropout. He compared the connectivities 
of electrolytes and expressed a version of Ohm's law way ahead of time. Um, and uh, he, he measured uh, the gravitational constant. And, um, and he came up with really water, which at that point was phlogiston, phlogist, phlogiston and dephlogisticated air, which I love, those names, um, which is hydrogen and oxygen. But anyway, um, you know, water has these really interesting properties. This is a wonderful website to read about water. I'll give you the answer. It actually looks like this, right? Water sees water like this, not like this, right? So um, it really sees it you know, much more spherical than we usually draw it. Um, and yet it does have, you know, these very definite bondings that it likes to do. And the point I want to make is when you go into an MD code, and you put water in there. Did you use water in your protein simulations? Yeah. What, which water did you pick? I, I mean, you must have picked a potential, or the code picked a potential. Right? Tip 3P, tip 4P. Well, there's hundreds of them. There's hundred, these are just a few water potentials. Why are there so many? Well, because some of them reproduce some things better than others. right? And, that gets to be a, a really serious problem if you want to study some of the fundamental problems of water. Um, and there's so many mysteries that we still don't know um, in terms of just what happens when water evaporates, freezes. Um, and so you know, which one is best? Well, this is a perfect problem for quantum mechanics. Okay? And, and I won't uh, go through the details, but you, know, um, you, can, you can do water with quantum. Um, and this is a good way to validate which potential you use in your classical simulations. You can also calculate phonons. You can just displace atoms and calculate energies, uh, energy differences, and get frequencies. Right? So you can calculate phonons. And when you calculate phonons in a crystal that's different than in a molecule, okay, um, when you calculate phonons in a crystal, you're getting you know, the waves, the sound waves. You're going to get the, the, uh, the acoustic waves in the material. Right? Um, so you know, in, in, let's go you're just using water. In a water molecule, how many phonon modes do I have in a water molecule? Who can tell me? Take a guess. It's a good guess. Let's get rid of translational and rotational. How many ways can a, mo a water molecule stretch? Yeah, there's actually three, right? Because you can have the OHs can stretch and the bond can stretch. But then there's sort of two different ways that it can go, right? And so um, uh, those are your phonon modes for the molecule. It's just stretch frequencies, right? And they can be measured. In a solid, you calculate your phonon modes by moving atoms around in the lattice. Right? And that actually gives you um, the behavior of, of the wave, of the sound waves in the material, which tells you something about how sound travels in the solid. You can calculate the sound velocity. You can calculate thermal uh, transport. You can calculate the heat capacity of the material. All of this uh, are things that we do with quantum mechanics that we're not going to do you know, in any of our problems or any more. But I just wanted you to be aware of some of the things that people do in, in research and, and that are, you know, uh, uh, really a, a big part of quantum mechanical simulations. Okay. Now, um, I, so, so those are some of the properties. So that was sort of the point here. You can do a wide, calculate a wide range of properties. This has sort of been our focus, these two, okay? And we're going to stay with that focus, but there's a, a very large range of things you can do. Um, now, I want to just end. I got five minutes, OK? And I'm, I'm going to start solar. We'll start solar with this on uh, Tuesday. But for five minutes, I want to do a simulation. Um, so, um, so we'll start solar on Tuesday. But here we are. You know which tool it is. It's our favorite. And we'll do another problem you know, or two in class. And I can, I can do a little review. I, I sort of did that on Tuesday of this week. Does anybody want to do more review next week? Or what do you guys think? A little bit? Yeah?
I can do some sort of like, what I'll do next Tuesday is we'll do another homework problem from last um, uh, year, uh, another quiz problem from last year like we did today. I'll ask if you have any questions about this practice uh, quiz, but I'll, I'll also post the solutions. And I'll, I'll go over sort of some key things to keep in mind for the quiz, OK? So we'll spend the first half of class on that then. But let me just spend the last few minutes here. Let's do a simulation, OK? It's open notes. Open notes, yeah. Uh, I think no. Because that's sort of like open everything. That's like everything, right? Is it, uh, what did you guys do in the first part? You had the computers? OK. I mean, um, you know, so OK, let's put it this way. If we do open computers, then I'll make the problems harder. No. OK. <laughs> All right. Because I think, I mean, I think because, you know, if you have the, you know, Wikipedia is pretty powerful, right? And, and Google. And so, you know, if you have that, um, you can find a lot of uh, close answers um, with the quick search. So I, I'd have to kind of be a little more creative. But, I, you know, I, you won't need your computers. Yeah, and it's full open notes, right? So, um, OK. Now, um, here's what I wanted to do. So, um, OK. Let's go to our favorite thing here, Siesta. There it is. Um, so I wanted to show you this, uh, first of all, this feature here, which is that spin polarized. You see? Yes, no. OK? Now, when it's yes and I calculate silicon, OK, here's the, um, here's the calculation of uh, the density of states of silicon is what I want to show you. Um, what you are going to find. Oh, I didn't plot the structure. OK. Is that, OK, so this is kind of just rounding out our, our siesta uh, you know, understanding of what the tool does, because there were just these few things that we hadn't talked about. Um, this is the density of states. And you now really feel your oneness with this. You know what these are. You look at this, and you, you, and you get emotional, which is OK. OK? But look at this. I also have here. Because I did, um, uh, let's see if it does this right, uh, total, and there. Look at that. OK. You see, it's automatically doing what's called a projected density of states. And what a projected density of states is, is it's the density of states, but only for certain part of the system, which turns out to be really interesting. Like sometimes you just want to know the density of states for one type of atom. Where is that atom contributing to the states? OK? Or in this case, because it is spin polarized, it's giving me the density of states for spin down and spin up separately. And look at this. They are, um, well, spin down, spin down. It, you can't see it um, because it, there's some spin up in there. They're exactly on top of each other. What does that mean? There's all the spin up electrons when they're paired with spin down, they all um, have the same energy. Okay? They have the exact same position on this, and they lead to this total DOS here. They just add up. But now, if, and so if I did silicon with spin polarized off, then um, the answer would be exactly the same. So there was really no need to do it with spin polarized, but it's the default. And now if I do iron, you see, and I press simulate, then um, what you'll find is that um, uh, you should see a difference. Let's see if we do. OK. Here is iron. And now you have the total, the total density of states. Oh, what is this? Um, I forget. Is this an insulator? How do I know? Because I got some DOS here. 
right? In, at the Fermi energy. And if I do the, the oh, we got to do it for um, iron. OK, and now look at this. This is beautiful. There is um, my spin. OK, so there is, this is the total, the green. OK, that's the total. And look at this. The red is the spin down. And the blue is the spin up. And look at those differences. What does it mean? I mean, you got to integrate it to know, but there's a difference. There's a big difference in the spin up and spin down electrons and where they sit in energy space in the magnetic material. There can be. That's what makes it a magnet. Okay? And so if you integrate that difference up to here, well, then you're going to get its magnetization. Right? Um, if I simulated iron with spin polarized turned off, it would force it would force those to be exactly the same, and they would lie exactly on top of each other, just like they just did in silicon. Okay, but that would be not iron. So you got to be aware of what this spin spin thing is, and when you need it, when it's important. Keeping it on is safe. Okay? But I wanted you to know what it means. So, okay, very good. Have a good weekend. <laughs>